Um, at one point you talked about <coughs> the concept of reversing the chain of uh, computations that form the ledger, mm -hmm. uh, pointing out that some a nefarious actor could perhaps find a way to advantage themselves by reversing the chain and doing something um, that no one wants them to do, but that it gets too hard. At 10 steps, it becomes impractical. Um, my question is, how hard is, it, how hard is it to reverse one step, and what are the potential ways that one could use a single step to one's advantage if one did it quickly enough? So it is possible, um, but the effort that, while you're spending effort to uh, change one block, another block is currently being generated. And then you'll have, and this happens all the time, it's sort of like built into the consensus mechanism where you'll have multiple chains, you'll have chain splits. But if you have invalid transactions in there, it's likely that some nodes will end up rejecting it. And the chain with the verifiably true transactions will propagate faster, get out to more nodes, and then you'll have more blocks built on top of it. And at a certain point, those, the shorter chain, the chain that you tried to, to, to forge, will uh, be orphaned off. But for generally, if you want something, if you want to be really, really sure about it, and there's services that help with this, uh, you want to wait for 10 transactions. Three transactions are safe, six transactions you are really safe. That sounded a little different from what I was thinking. It sounds like you're describing why it doesn't really work to just make up fake data. Yeah. And I get that. But I thought what you were describing is that you can reverse engineer a step or two such that you could then make apparently real data and go forward in the, in the way you want to go. Right, but because this is all based on math and, and an algorithm, uh, you can't make apparently real data. You can, you can only fake it and hope that that gets buried in the transaction. So really it all gets hashed into that 256-bit uh, block header. Um, and then you're hoping that everybody else is going to assume that that block header is true. But then you're going to have all these other nodes that will look at the information in the chain and can see that that is not true because so with hashing, right? A hashing algorithm is hard to produce, easy to replicate, right? So you can verifiably prove, you know, that that uh, the square root of a number, right? But it's very hard to 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 sort of get backwards, especially for a very large number, right? So if I give you a huge number and tell you uh, this is the square root. You're like okay, but to solve that square, uh, or sorry, the yeah, the it's it's much harder. I right? think he's talking about double spends also. Well, yeah, but that's that's ver that's falsifying information, right? Yeah. Um, so did, does that answer your question? Like, I guess the 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 advice people give is just wait until your transaction is deep enough into the blockchain that nobody will spend that much work getting it out until you say um, release the funds for which you were paid or release the goods for which you were paid. Does that make sense? Well, from your answers, I'm thinking I probably slightly misunderstood what you were saying at the time, so yeah. I think I'm straightened out. Okay, yeah. I uh, highly recommend, um, on the previous slide, there's a book by this guy, Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, he wrote Mastering Bitcoin, the second edition's about to come out. He does a fantastic job of explaining even the sort of more obscure uh, math and cryptography stuff that goes behind this. And you can really see how these blocks are structured, why it's computationally difficult to forge and, and reverse. Um, yeah. Oh, great talk, guys. Um, I was just wondering, so, so far all the examples are about complete blocks being added to the chain. I was just wondering, like, if someone is buying or selling like a fractional coin on Coinbase or something, mm -hmm. what's what's really going on? Is there an actual encryption? So a transaction is not a full coin necessarily. So Bitcoin gets uh, broken down; <laughs> it's uh, down to eight decimal points, and other coins have other you know units. And Bitcoin probably, if there was, if we they got to a consensus and there was a need for it, you could break it down even more. Am, am I understanding here? Okay, so that means that there's some sort of atomic level where uh, it, it's divisible down to. Yeah. So then I was wondering, so if um, a miner solves like my uh, $20 value, like uh, Bitcoin transaction, mm -hmm. that miner still gets like $30,000 like, worth so of... So many transactions are put into one block. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and uh, the coin itself can be split up, right? So you can, uh, you can own you know, one Satoshi, which is still worth a fraction of a cent. It's the smallest unit. Um, so uh, y like, it's weird. Like, the, the, the way that money and ledgers work in Bitcoin is actually different. Like, n right now, the way we keep track of our funds, you say you have this many dollars, and you could only you have to have 
be able to hold that certain thing in your hand. But actually, the way that Bitcoin accounts are tracked is by is uh, they're called uh, UTXOs, un um, so, uh, unspent unspent transaction outputs. Yeah, unspent transaction outputs. Um, and so what that is, is is basically your funds, the amount of funds that you hold is the total accumulation of all outputs that have been sent to, to your address. And that, that output that was sent to you um, could be a fraction of a cent. Um, and then when that output is sent, it's signed and then put into a block. Uh, mm -hmm. So you don't actually have to send a bit Bitcoin. It's not like how I, if I only have a dollar in my pocket, I have to give a dollar and get a certain amount of change back. Yeah. Also, if you guys want to start signing up for the Slack. Um, well, no, let's do the questions first. Let me break up. Isn't it get too confusing? Yeah. But if you have to go and you want to leave, like leave it with somebody or leave it with a friend, that works too. Um, I'm confused, I guess, because you said it, it's a, like a devaluating currency, Bitcoin, and that deflationary. The deflationary, yeah. and the miners are the ones who are like validating transactions. But the amount of money that they get when they mine is going to become nothing, essentially. Yeah. So what incentivizes them to keep mining, and how does it stay like? Right, so yeah, they're exactly. getting they're getting the block reward, and they're getting transaction fees. So there's a small you. Uh, it used to be optional, but now the blocks are so full that you really do need to uh, pay the miner a little bit in order to process your transaction included in the block. Um, and the idea is, and that like the really cool sort of economics behind it, like this. What I'm about to say makes more sense now, but you got to think that this was. Th this was conceived when there was no value behind it. So the idea is, is that this little bit of value that's included in your transaction, that value is going to go up and up as time goes on. So the value of Bitcoin goes up as the mining reward goes down. Um, and also the amount of transactions and the value of those transactions in each block is also going to go up. So right now we're actually at full blocks. Um, but there are plans to sort of increase that capacity. So does that answer? So it's like it's the transaction fees and the value of the coins itself. Um, yeah. Um, going off what you just said there, where you're sort of incentivized by the price raising, doesn't the inverse of that hold true then? Like, so if the price of it crashes, people are less likely to mine bitcoins, further like crashing the price. Like, isn't that a problem? Um, yeah. So it, it's sort of. But so what actually happens is, as it gets more valuable, you have a, it can be perceived as more centralization of the mining power. Um, and because it costs so much to be even competitive in solving this hashing algorithm. So if the price goes down and people decide to take units offline, it's actually greater chance that you might, uh, it takes basically takes less electricity to have a chance at winning the block reward, at which point more people in a decentralized manner will then join the network and it'll stabilize and, uh, yeah, stabilizes and, and goes up. But there is a certain precariousness in the sense that like, I mean, frankly, money only has value as long as it has perceived value, right? So there is a possibility that people say, no, that yellow colored, uh, you know, stone is gross. I don't want that anymore. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that people perceive it, it has value. And that's certainly possible with the paper we hold in our pocket. So there is a certain amount of trust that that value is going to hold. Um, and that's it, it, sort of the point to uh, the ICO discussion is like it, the early adopters are rewarded now because they got in when it was worth nothing. And it's worth a lot more than that now. Um, go over here. Uh, so I have a question in regards to the graph you guys had earlier. Um, I was just curious where you thought Bitcoin is and as well as Ethereum is on that graph in terms of like adoption and... Um, Which use. graph? Uh, I don't know. It was like a green and blue bar one. Um. Early adopters, uh, not much traction. Sure. Yeah, not much traction. Um, but like, you know, has Bitcoin like past that point where they intersect or well we might very well be in the middle of a bubble right now so it, we might be at the very beginning of it about to be going to the moon or we could be in a bubble where it's about to crash but um i don't know if you had anything to add to that. i don't know there's many different ways you can kind of yeah. size the market like some people compare it to gold which in that case bitcoin is extremely undervalued but if it's like something else then it's, it's really hard to say yeah i mean it's it's starting right i think um the way that i've been looking at the current uh, 
like where the market is. There was a, a big spike where Bitcoin went from a couple dollars, really I think it was like $10 where it was staying around to $1,200 in a few months. This was back in 2013. Um, and then there was a couple sort of crises that happened. And uh, that was mostly speculation. There was a lot of uh, Chinese money that was going into mining at the beginning, people that, Chinese citizens that didn't have the opportunity to invest in stock markets and things that were getting into that. And then it spiked and then people were just sort of wanting to, to get in on the action. Then once that stopped and once there was like a hack of Mt. Gox, which was an exchange back then, and Silk Road got cracked down and then it crashed back down to 200. Now what I think is different about what's going on right now is that back then it was just like, oh, you know, this thing, this random has gone up in value by 10x, let me get in on it. Now what's going on is there's people, I think there's a f like all of us in this room that have been in it, I, like we've all had in the past week, I've had friends and family come, it's like, oh yeah, that Bitcoin thing that you were talking about for the past three years, it's, it's still there and it's worth a lot more money, so how do I buy it? Right, so there's like, now there's this point where people have heard about it, doubted it, and now are deciding to come in on it. I don't know where that's gonna, I, like, I'm not an accredited <laughs> investor or anything, so please don't, you know, invest on my advice, but um, at least the people like us that are in it for the long haul, we think that there's a lot of room to grow, and there's a, yeah, I mean, I can't transact with any of you guys in Bitcoin or Ethereum right now, so haven't gotten to mass adoption, but might get there. Yeah? Uh, what are the transaction fees how, like how much are they um, per transaction? Is it a percentage or? So, I mean, what's actually kind of cool about Bitcoin is that, um, or any of these systems, is that they're based on the size of your transaction, the, the like file size of your transaction rather than the amount of money you want to send, right? So if you want to send a million dollars in normal systems, it costs a lot more money, but you can send a million dollars for for pennies if it's a small number of kilobytes uh, or bytes really in the transaction. But right now, Bitcoin, because um, as mentioned, is reaching these sort of bottlenecks and scaling issues, transactions now are anywhere from like, I don't know, 50 cents to around a dollar uh, for any transaction. Ethereum uh, is way cheaper. Um, and then any of the smaller altcoins, because they don't have any scaling issues, uh, it's, it's almost free. So, yeah. So wouldn't that uh, insinuate that over time it becomes unprofitable to, to even send like a single Satoshi? Like um, you just have money that gets stuck? Yeah, I mean, th there's, there's solutions in place that will re um, relieve these bottlenecks. And um, it's the other sort of, sort of side interesting thing about this space is we're watching a decentralized political system in play. And we like to think in this country that our political problems are uniquely special and how bad and gross they can get, but man, Humans suck sometimes, and politics get messy. Uh, so there's different solutions that are in play, uh, that have been tested, um, that are being deployed. They're even being deployed in alternative currencies as sort of like a test network for it. Um, so yes, and but that will be resolved, hopefully. Um, sorry, I've been looking on this side mostly. I don't know if any of you guys have questions. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, we have this uh, upcoming Monday off, and if we uh, wanted to take a look and um, to get a, say if we wanted to get started with Bitcoin, what would be some of the, uh, some of the first steps to be uh, getting started? Well, I definitely recommend hopping on the Slack channel and uh, just talking, talking with all of us. Um, so I am soon to be working at a Bitcoin company. There's another guy who th that was in my cohort that works for a Bitcoin company in, in the Philippines now. Um, developer on the, for Ethereum is over here right now. He's, uh, he was a tech mentor before and he's, yeah. <laughs> Um, so hop on, ask us questions. There's a list of resources. Um, I really, the biggest thing, and this is sort of like the motto of, of Hack Reactor, right, is just start building. You know, uh, download Truffle, get, get Truffle installed. Um, uh, 21, the Python library for, a, it's a Bitcoin uh, system, is very easy to use. Uh, Bcoin is, uh, that's where I'm gonna be starting to work, is a full JavaScript implementation. Uh, this is a very new project, but you can read the entire code and see how it works all, all in JavaScript. So, um, you know, set yourself up a wallet, go to coinbase.com, buy some coins, set up a, a node, uh, 
with with Bitcoin and on a Raspberry Pi, send yourself some funds and and you know go from there. Maybe code some smart contracts in Ethereum, which uh, their native language is Solidity, which is very JavaScript like, easy to follow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you're thinking about uh, adding to the blockchain. How is it that you can do that since this is a totally decentralized system? Um, there's there's a GitHub repo, and you purport you propose forks, and the so it's it's also interesting, right? Because like even if something gets into the repo, uh, all the other users of of the the network or a, a significant portion of them have to agree to use that implementation. So. Uh, the community will, you know, discuss any proposed uh, pull requests, and if the, com the sort of developer community comes to a consensus, uh, it'll get added in. Usually, that's done with a lot of other discussion because it's open source. You know, there's no, I mean, there are some closed doors discu discussions, but you can see a pull request that goes into the into the library. So, yeah. Uh, so I just had a quick question uh, earlier. You mentioned you said. Get a Raspberry Pi, set up a node. Did, um, can you elaborate on that? Like, do you mean node like just you just node JS or have it work with uh, Bitcoin for like? Mining yeah. So so Bitcoin is a uh, it's it runs on Node, um, and it runs on Node JS. But a full node in Bitcoin, a node in Bitcoin is something that is like basically verifies transactions. A full node is one that has the entire history of the blockchain downloaded and so can verify transactions that come in and out of it uh, by looking up against that, um, the chain. Um, to mine, you can set up a mining rig. You can buy an ASIC miner, which is basically, it's a chip that's been specially designed to solve the SHA-256 algorithm and just try and get there. But um, at this point, unless you're at a very large scale, it's uh, you're going to spend more on electricity than you're likely to to win in mining rewards. So I mean, I was just curious on the simple aspect of just pur purchasing it. Do yeah. you do you need a node, or does that get referenced? Um, you can oh. so to to purchase it. If you do it, any any exchange um, offers uh, wallet services as well. Um, those are hosted wallet services. So the whole point, uh, like that graph of uh, you know not needing third parties, you're basically trusting a third party still to ho host your wallet. But there are um, there are software wallets like you get there's for iOS uh, bread wallet is probably the most popular and for um, Android mycelium uh, and download the wallet, buy it on an exchange like Coinbase or Gemini. And then you can send that Bitcoin to your to your software wallet. You can you can create a cold wallet. You can do a paper wallet. You can actually generate a private and public key and send an, an address and then send fun, just print it out on a piece of paper. You can even write it out and memorize it. Send funds to the public address. And then as long as you still have that private key, you can sign transactions to send that those coins out. Mm, yeah. Um. <coughs> I'm, I'm thinking about a time in the future where, hypothetically, it may be that Bit Bitcoin or something like it has been largely adopted by a large segment to the point, let's say it's 80 years from now, and you could say the majority of the economy is using some kind of blockchain, a, a single blockchain technology. Yeah. That could happen, right? Yep. I mean, that's certainly that's what the people who are promoting it would like to happen. Um, and also, how money works and how economies work is deeply intertwined with the quality of the life of the people in a society and the quality of that society, which is why we have things like uh, legally mandated monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And in this model, I, I don't, I, I'd like to hear your speculation on how something like socially conscious monetary policy would plug in to a scenario I described where Bitcoin is the majority of the economy. Because right now, near as I can tell, there is none. Yeah. A and yet monetary policy is one of the most important things that our government does, f in theory, for the good of all. Yeah. Well, and my response to that would, to that would be um, that's, in theory, what they're supposed to do, and they're not very good at it. Um, and this is why I said, like, one of the benefits is depoliticize money supply. And in fact, until 1972, um, w fully, and before, before that until about 1913, um, that wasn't the job of the government. Um, and uh, okay, anybody. What? Take, take the government issue out sure. of it. 
any monetary policy coming from anywhere that we can trust to be designed for the good of all. Because in theory, some monetary policy is better than none. Well, okay, well, the mon monetary policy I uh, of Bitcoin is, is in the code. So the, the, the theory posited with the developers of Bitcoin were saying that it would be better for all to have a deflationary money supply with a predictable growth rate um, or a predictable rate of growth that diminishes over time. Um, so that was a theory for the good of all. And um, whether or not that's true will happen in a very de democratic way, right? Like uh, anybody who thinks that that is better will start, will start buying it. And as that grows up, if more people believe that that's true, they'll start using it. If they think something else is true, they'll buy something else. Remember, we're talking about 80 years from now yeah. where most people kind of have no choice. Why would you have no choice? You because can right now, what if I wanted to pay in, in green stamps? Uh huh. I couldn't. Okay, because you could pay to take money. You could pay to anybody <laughs> that would accept it. Okay, but let's say I don't like American dollars. Uh -huh. I'm against them. Sure. Well, what are my options? Uh, right? Bitcoin. That's I mean, there's a lot of people <laughs> got into Bitcoin. <laughs> I, yeah. are, are you deliberately obfuscating, or, or do no. you think that my, th my thesis is incorrect in some way? I think what you're describing specifically is the scenario in which you are not able to spend money to any other person is exactly how Bitcoin got started. So yeah. if that should happen, then if Bitcoin... If Bitcoin can bootstrap itself, another currency should be able to also. And, and in fact, they have. Yeah. Um, yeah, th that's not what I meant. I mean that if most people are doing something, generally you have to do it too or suffer huge costs. Like if I wanted to use a rotary phone, mm -hmm. it's not impossible. It's just ridiculously impractical, which is why I can't use a rotary phone. Right. I mean, in theory I could, but really I can't. So 80 years from now in my scenario, I wouldn't be able to live my life without using Bitcoin. Sure. I mean, like, I th I mean, this is maybe a difference in vision and a difference in politics, frankly, but I think the point that Dylan made about the fact, like, the very first actual, uh, the first block, it's called the Genesis block that was ever mined by Satoshi, had in it, um, it you, can, you can actually look at the first block, it's hashed into, into it, was the headline from 2009 of the, one of the first bailouts that happened. It was a headline from the Telegraph, I think. Um, uh, anyway, and the, and the date, right? And so the idea behind that was like, our system has failed us. I don't want to use this system anymore. I've now created something that I hope more people will use. And you're right. I mean, if you couldn't go from day one saying, okay, ev everybody's using Bitcoin, I don't want to use it because I think it's harmful to society, to day two where you're using something else. But from 2009 to 2017, there are now people that operate their entire lives solely on Bitcoin, solely on that monetary Okay, system. so imagine there's some terrible thing that happens with Bitcoin money 80 yeah. years from now. It, uh, it crashes. It explodes. Sure. It, yeah. it catches on fire. Something. Uh -huh. I mean, these are things that are theoretically possible. Mm -hmm. It could happen. And there's nobody at the steering wheel, in theory. Mm. Or my question is, who might be at the steering wheel? Yeah. I mean, it's tough to trust a decentralized system. in eight system. years, yeah. wars can start. People can starve yeah. in eight years yeah. if, if monetary systems collapse badly enough. Yeah. Uh, I mean... Wars have started with the current monetary system that's supposedly in place for the good of, of everyone. And well, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I'm happy, I, I love talking about this stuff, so we can talk, talk, talk more after, but it's really like, uh, there's people that have a view that think that this is the, the better way forward, it's not perfect. Uh, we don't know a perfect system, and this is sort of what, like, what's, I don't know, what I find beautiful about human nature is that we're just in this, co this like, constant, um, process of improvement, of experimentation, of failure, and trying to find out the way that we can improve our own lives primarily, but those around us as well. Um, so, yep. Uh, could you talk more about the SHA algorithms? Um, I mean, specifically, like, how they go about solving the issue? Is it a pure brute force thing? Are there optimizations? Yeah. Or yeah. It's, um, is there, there are optimizations, which is where the ASIC, uh, the ASIC, so when you first started mining, it was with CPUs, and then it got harder, so they used GPUs, and now they have dedicated chips that are just built, like, to be as efficient as possible at solving the, the algorithm, so, yeah. 